Yeah, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Bindu, IFMR, Nachiket, Sujanita, everyone for inviting me here. It's really a great pleasure. I've been a big admirer and friend of IFMR for many years, and so it was really wonderful to come here to speak to all of you. Today, I'm going to indulge in a thought experiment, and uh, I'm going to try to connect some dots, and you, you're welcome to take it or not accept it, but I thought it's a good time. I'm calling this as, uh, I, I believe that we are at a point of fundamental disruption in financial services. And I'm calling this as, are we at a WhatsApp moment in finance? Are we at a WhatsApp, or WhatsApp moment in finance? Now let me explain to you what I mean by that. If you go back and look at 2009, there was a huge transition that happened in the world, voice to data networks, from feature phones to smartphones. Apple had come out with the iPhone and Android had come out in 2009. From the desktop internet to the mobile internet, and from vast services offered by uh, telecom vendors to what's called over the top or services over the net neutrality to allow applications. And telecom was a multi-billion dollar industry which, uh, where SMS was about 15% of revenue, MMS had been launched. At the same time, the internet companies like Facebook and Google who were creating billions of users using their identity and desktop systems. But who won the messaging war? Who won the messaging war? It was not an AT&T or a Verizon or an Airtel. It was not Facebook or Google. It was a company called WhatsApp, which was set up in 2009, which used the phone number as the identity, not an email ID, which used the contacts in your phone as the social graph to know whom else to connect with, who used, who attacked the messaging of, uh, uh, you know, of the uh, revenue of the uh, telcos, and today they're attacking walls. Now let me give you some staggering figures. There are a total of 40 engineers in WhatsApp. Maybe it's gone up a little after they say Facebook bought them. Today, the volume of all the SMSs of all the mobile operators on the planet put together is 20 billion messages. The volume of WhatsApp is 30 billion messages. So one company started six years back, does 50% more messaging then all the telcos put together. That's disruption. Yeah. So now with 800 million active users, once they offer voice, they're attacking the 85% of revenue, which is why this whole big battle in India about net neutrality. Because if WhatsApp and other people like them offer voice, then it fundamentally affects the telco revenue. This is an example of disruption. But in 2009, nobody actually you know, connected all these dots together. Now let's move forward. And let's talk about what's happening in India. First is the rise of the smartphone. Today, the number of smartphones in the country has gone up from 40 million to 150 million in 18 months. Android phones are coming for 6,000 rupees and less. You can get a Firefox phone for 2,000. And there are various estimates that the number of mobile phones, smartphones in India, will go to 500 million, 700 million in the next three to four years. Yeah. Indian e-commerce is the high, most highly mobilized e-commerce anywhere in the world. In other words, the largest proportion of transactions from mobile phones is in India, where 41% of e-commerce transactions are for mobile phones. This is Mary Meeker's data. And if you look at all the big e-commerce players, you'll see that they're much, much bigger than any of the other players, including Alibaba from China or Amazon and others. So fundamentally, it's a highly mobilized net. In other words, India is mobile first. You first get onto the internet through the mobile. Now, this move will, we think, lead to a cashless economy, and we'll explain why we think so. Yeah. Now, today, only 5% of personal expenditure in India is electronic. 95% is cash. But there are a number of trends happening which we think will start moving this whole system towards cashless, and I'll walk you through each of them. The first is, for the first time, and this is RBI data, electronic clearing has caught up with paper clearing. Last quarter, right? Look at the numbers, it's just gone up like this. This is ECS, NHH, IMPS, you add it. Electronic clearing has caught up with paper clearing in a dramatically in about four years. Next, IMPS, which is the immediate payment system launched by NPCI, in three years has surpassed money orders that were launched in 1880. In fact, the post office has discontinued money orders and the, one sec, the value of 
go, go, go back. So in three years from launch, it's already overtaken uh, money orders by a wide margin. And if you look at the IMPS volumes for today, it will soon overtake card sales. Cards have been around for 60, 50 years. So a product launched by NPCI, a public sector, non-profit banking cooperative using online technology will overtake all card transactions in three to four years. I mean, in, since inception next year. Then let's look at e-commerce. Yeah. E-commerce is going to go up four times by 2020 to about $60 billion. And modern trade is going to go up about three times. All these things will increase the transition to cashless because as more people pay online and so on. So that's another trend. And then there is the whole issue of digital recharges. Yeah. Indians do 3 billion recharges a month on their mobile phones because 99% of Indian mobile phones are prepaid and only 3% of them are electronic. However, if you look at smartphones, in smartphones, I estimate the number of digital rechargers is more like 20%. In other words, when we migrate our system from feature phone to smartphone, you're going to see a corresponding rise in the proportion of digital rechargers. So as you see, whether you look at credit or whether you look at money order remittance or whether you look at uh, you know, uh, debit cards or you look at recharge, on every dimension, there's a dramatic change happening in terms of cashless and electronification. Yeah. If you look at DBT, today the LPG program does 3 million transfers a day, a billion transactions a year. In other words, 120 million people are getting cash transfers of 3 to 400 rupees each time they buy a cylinder, which is the world's largest cash transfer program. And if you continue with this process, and we had put a roadmap for this for uh, kerosene and so on, we're talking about 4 billion transactions which will amount to about 300,000 crore rupees, 60 billion, 50 billion dollars. And this money stays digital because it's going from directly from the government into somebody's bank account. So all these things are happening right now as we speak. Yeah. So what is this shift meaning? On Aadhaar, we are now at 910 million Aadhaars issued at the rate and added at the rate of about 20 million a month. So we're looking at 1 billion people with an Aadhaar digital identity by March 2016. And each of those is capable of doing an online authentication to verify identity and an online KYC to open a bank account. Yeah. So the fundamental nature of authentication is changing. Historically, the way it worked was you had a card, which is what you have, and you had a PIN or a password which is what you know. And both these things together were called as two-factor authentication. That's what we do when we do financial transactions. Now, the card will be replaced by the phone. Because your phone is in your pocket, you don't need a card. So the phone becomes the card. And you no longer need a PIN because you can use Aadhaar online authentication to find out who he is. So the two factors will go from PIN and card to phone and Aadhaar. And this is one click, one click. That means 900 million people will be able to do single click two-factor authentication in the next few months. This is fundamentally transforming the way we do credentials in the real world. And this is happening because of biometric smartphones. Those of you who have an Apple iPhone know that it has a touch ID with which you do Apple Pay. That's an example of a biometric smartphone. But in the future, it's going to go beyond uh, fingerprints to the iris recognition. So you're going to have phones that do the iris recognition and the ADA system was built with both fingerprint and iris. So you can do iris recognition on a smartphone in real time. Yeah. So then other things happening clearly between PMG, JDY and all that, there's attempt to give everybody a, a bank account. Now what this is saying is that fundamentally the only scalable infrastructure for payments in the future is going to be phones. Because if you look at the volumes, credit cards grow at 15%, but devices to use them grow at 10%. Debit cards grow at 54%, ATMs grow at 30%. In other words, your acquiring infrastructure is growing faster than your, I'm sorry, your issuing infrastructure is growing faster than your acquiring infrastructure. However, smartphones in the same time grew 275%. 
So the only acquiring infrastructure which is ahead of the uh, issuing is a smartphone. In other words, where the issuing transaction is a smartphone with two-factor authentication and the acquiring device is also a smartphone with two-factor authentication. Now the other big thing which is happening is that NPCI is rolling out something called the unified payment interface which allows peer-to-peer -peer payment from any bank account to any bank account on a mobile phone and this will enable peer-to-peer -peer payments. What this does is fundamentally will transform the way we do. Today we have maybe 125 bank branches going to 150, ATMs will go to 270, POS machines to 1.5, BC agents to 3 million, retail outlets to 15 million. But when I have peer-to-peer -peer digital payments, anyone can be a BC. Because it's like getting change from somebody. I go to somebody, I'll transfer 100 rupees into his account and he gives me 100 rupees cash. So everybody is a BC. So suddenly you have changed the whole infrastructure. You don't need, I'm saying five years down the road, you, you can think of everybody being a BC. Every retail transaction is, 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 a, is a BC transaction. So fundamentally, you unlock the possibility of converting digital money to physical money and, and back. Now what we have done in the last few years as part of Aadhaar, etc., is we have built a number of layers. The two layers you saw was Aadhaar authentication using IRIS and the Aadhaar EKYC, which is sufficient to open a bank account. Then you have something called eSign, which has been launched by the CCA, which allows you to sign a document with a digital signature with your Aadhaar number. So you don't need a dongle and all those things. So your mobile phone, you can sign a document. Then there is also a network of digital lockers or repositories where I can store all my documents digitally and retrieve them wherever I want. So let's say that you know uh, you graduate from a university, your degree certificates go into this locker. When you go for a job interview, you just give the address in your locker and it picks it up from there. And the whole thing is paperless. And then you have the unified payment interface I talked about. And the whole GSTN architecture also which we have been involved with is going to be API led. So essentially you will have the transaction details with user consent of every taxpayer of indirect tax in the country in the matter of next three to four years. So all these platforms are all API based open interoperable platforms and in the case of Aadhaar available today for 900 million people. Yeah. So what's going to happen is we will go from data poor to data rich country in five years. So you'll have multiple data streams, you'll have social people what they use on Facebook or Google. You'll have commerce, what they buy at Amazon or Flipkart. You'll have payments because every payment will be digital. You'll have entirely paperless processes using those platforms and you'll have identity with Aadhaar. So that combined with machine learning and algorithms fundamentally changes the way you can deliver financial services. You can deliver financial services cashless, paperless and presence-less. You don't have to be physically present in front of somebody to do something. You can do it over the cloud because Aadhaar verifies your identity and your digital profile enables the service provider to decide what loan you're eligible for or whatever it is they're doing. So fundamentally you can become presence-less. Yeah. So that means that banking as we think of it is going to re we reimagine. What does that mean? So today for example, this is how we would open a bank account paperwork. Today a bank like Federal Bank has launched a completely smartphone based system and using what, I, what, uh, what Pramod and Sanjay showed you, we can have uh, instant eKYC on smartphone and tomorrow that can be done as a self-service. In other words, I can sit in my house, look at my phone and open a bank account. So this changes everything. <coughs> Similarly, instant SIM cards, investment accounts, all that is possible. Now we think that this is going to be at the heart of the credit explosion that is the next phase of what's going to happen. So this is an example of how we think credit will work in the, in the, in the kind of models you talked about. This entire thing can be done on a mobile phone. You need a loan, you agree to share your data, you see loan offers, accept the best offer, receive the loan, get paid into your account and repay from this. All this in your mobile phone in real time. And for that we think there are a number of things we have to do like paperless contracts, marketplaces and all that. Again, these are all software layers around, around this whole thing and all based on digital exhaust and around that you have all the platforms we talked about, Aadhaar, EKYC. So the fundamentally, the entire process of giving high, high volume, low value credit can be made instantaneous, paperless, presenceless, anytime. Yeah. So if you think of the bank, 
today, the bank is full of people signing so-called wet signatures, lots of contracts, money being given physically, some guy sitting and deciding whether you're credit worthy or not, uh, cash, ATMs, identity card, one, you know, one speed post sends you one debit card, another speed post sends you the pin, and you know, all kinds of stuff like that. All this will be done in a mobile phone. All this, right? You can do e-sign, you can have a locker to keep your document, mobile payment will come into your account, algorithms will decide whether you're credit worthy, all, you know, other authentication. So fundamentally, every single process done by a bank can be done electronically on a mobile phone in the next five years. Yeah. So the next thing, of course, is the phenomenal work done by, you know, Nachiket, Bindu, and others on creating the new architecture for competition. With 11 payment bank licenses, you're going to get new diverse players with new backgrounds, new capital, and new technology into the banking sector, and you know this very well, and you know all the names. And then, of course, the small banks will come shortly. Yeah. Now, it's under, uh, important to understand that in this new technological world, people are driven by customer acquisition and market share and not by profit. This is a fundamentally different view of business. It is about creating technology platforms that scale up and who gets the cust first customer wins. It's not about profit. Profit is supposed to come later, you know, after you have the customers. Now, if this has led to a phenomenon called the unicorns, as you know, in the US, these are private companies. This is because SEBI, uh, SEC made a change in the rules about four years back that allowed private companies to have a lot many more shareholders and they could, without going public. And that allowed this creation of companies like Uber and Snapchat, all of them worth billions of dollars. And we have seen the same unicorn phenomenon in India, where Flipkart at the last valuation, 15 billion, Paytm at 2 billion, and so on. So you have this phenomenon happening in both places. All these are driven by private markets. They're not public markets. If they go public, you know, it's very difficult. If you're public, then you have to answer to all these analysts and all these guys. But if you're private, you apparently are not answerable to anyone. So you can do exactly what you want. And what happens here is that in these digital economies, there's what's called as the winner takes all syndrome. Or that's what they believe. That one guy is going to win because the stronger your network is, the, the, you have a virtual cycle of usage. And if you look at, for example, the, uh, the taxi, or whatever you want to call that business, Uber is the number one player in the US, is worth 50 billion. The number two player in the US is Lyft worth only 5 billion. So it's not like you are two people worth 20 billion. You are one guy worth 50, one guy worth 5. So when that is the thinking, what happens is that you get this winner takes all uh, syndrome. And so we think that just like all this happened, banking is going to get disrupted. I'm sorry to tell everyone this. Yes. And uh, first, thanks to the payment banks, thanks to the mobile, thanks to UPI, you will have a completely new payment experience on the mobile. Second, the fundamental notion of lending will change with data and algorithms. And third, once the mobile phone becomes the face of the customer, the CASA deposits will flow there. So you're really going to find disruption on all aspects. Yeah. Now, what are the advantages? There are three classes of players in this. First, you have the telcos. They have the advantage of distribution relationships. They know how to do low value, high volume, low cost transactions. Then you have the wallet providers like Paytm, which does payments, high tech. Again, very high volume. Not very high value. If you see the value, is not high, but very high volume. So you have new guys coming into the game. I don't know if you know this, but Paytm, which was set up in 2010, is already the largest transaction volume in the country. They're bigger than any bank today, right? I'm not talking about value. I'm talking about transaction volume. They do a lot of small transactions, you know, you, the recharges. They're 50% of the recharge market is with Paytm. They do uh, Uber and all that. So already in, in five years, a company that nobody heard of does more payment transactions than all the banks, I mean, than any other bank. Yeah. Now, obviously, banks have great advantages. Head Start, distribution networks, they own the relationship, highly trusted brands. They can offer an omni-channel experience, and they have access to exactly the same technology. Nobody can say, you didn't know about this. It's coming, and here it is. And all this technology is, is a commodity. Anybody can use it. Yeah. So, but a lot can happen in five years. A lot can happen in five years. And I'll give you several examples of what can happen. 
Skype was a company launched in 2003. Today, Skype, the slide is a bit thing, but Skype is the world's largest international telephone company. The company launched, they're much bigger than AT&T and anybody else. And next, Facebook went from 100 million to 1.2 billion in five years, users. 100 million to 1.2 billion in five years. Aadhaar went from, Aadhaar was launched on September 29, 2010. So in five years, which is about three weeks away, it will be at 920 million Aadhaar issued in five years. Okay? Uber went from nothing to 150 active drivers in the US in 2.5 years. Airbnb, oh, US oil production, you know, you think all the, all the tech stuff and mobile phone, all what's a big deal, right? US oil production, US oil production went from 5.5 barrels to 9.6 million barrels a day in five years. The US went from being an ex importer to an exporter in five years because they used innovation, fracking, horizontal drilling, data analytics, whatever the hell it is. But they did it. Smartphone volumes globally went from 172 million to 1.24 billion in five years. Right? Photographs. The peak of photography on film was 80 billion images in 1999. This year, the total number of digital images is 2 trillion. 2 trillion, if you add up Snapchat and WeChat and you know, Instagram and all this stuff, more digital images have been done in one year than the history of film since Eastman Kodak invented film 110 years back. In one year, that's what's happening out there. And Airbnb has become the world's largest hotel chain, bigger than Mar Marriott, bigger than Hyatt, bigger than everybody else, and already has 10% of the rooms in New York City. So there is, stuff can happen pretty fast. So we, yeah. So we, to summarize what's happening, there's government innovation, brilliant idea of payment banks, the Jandan Yojana DBT. Environment changes, a billion people with smartphones, a billion people with Aadhaar. Technology innovation, one click, two factor authentication on your smartphone. Market innovations, you wanna have billions of dollars flowing in. Some guy sitting, Alibaba, Jack Ma, worth 40 billion, for him, spending 5 billion in India, not a big deal. New players are coming in. All the, uh, whether it's Reliance, whether it's Dilip Sangvi, whether it's Anil, Sunil Mittal, others. And all these innovations, all these platforms we talked about. So this, our thesis that Pramod, Sanjay and I have come up with is that we are at the same point in Indian financial services that the global telecom industry was in 2009. And it's a WhatsApp moment. Now, we are not saying who's going to be the winner. The winner may be a startup somewhere, I don't know, or the winner could be the biggest banks of today. It's an equal race. But somebody, but finally, whether it's going to be a winner from the banks or from the startups, a billion people are going to benefit. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Neelkini, for laying out that very exciting vision for a brave new world in finance. We'd love to see some of those charts uh, as they apply to financial inclusion. Um, and, you know, much more for the IFMR team. I think yourself and your small team of people and the impact you've had has been a real source of inspiration. So thank you very much. I wanted to pick, I know that, you know, there will be a lot of questions in the audience, but I want to build on a few themes that you touched upon and just uh, speak a little bit more about that. Sure. So just starting off with the way the financial services provider uh, architecture will evolve. You briefly touched upon that. Um, it feels like you've practically built the entire technology backend for financial inclusion between Aadhaar, EKYC, and some of the newer stuff yeah, that design. I learned about today. Um, and in some sense, the traditional architecture has been universal banks doing end-to-end, -end, uh, you know, retail banking, payments, uh, bank accounts, uh, the whole works. It feels like one immediate implication of all of this backend is that it enables a lot more specialization and differentiation. Sure. Um, and our own vision at IFMR is that uh, you will start to see a lot more customer-focused originators yeah. sort of riding these platforms 
um, and then connecting to banks, mutual funds, etc. So if you will, a separation between the product owners, the platforms, and the customer facing. Um, would love to hear your thoughts a little bit. I think it was there on one of your slides. But just how do you see the provide yeah. architecture? No, no, I think you're un we are, the whole thing is getting unbundled, right? You'll have producers who'll have products. They could be loan products, they could be insurance products, and so on. Then there's going to be this network effect kind of thing. There's going to be distribution organizations that deliver this on a phone to everybody. And then they're going to be uh, first mile organizations, customer facing organizations which will leverage this platform and deliver at scale, keeping in mind the uniqueness requirement of their customer base. Right. So I think it's a complete unbundling of the value chain. And what's important to realize is that this is the only country in the planet that has these platforms. So part of our problem is we ask where else is it going to, where is, it's nowhere else. So there's no point saying, well, are we doing it like China or Mexico? It's not like, it's a brand new, fundamentally different architecture which allows complete unbundling. And what's going to happen because of the payment banks and small banks is that you'll have very efficient deliverers who can then combine with different producers and deliver a customized, unique experience to each user through a channel like yours. Absolutely, and that resonates quite a bit with how we think. Just, I think, speaking about credit a little bit, and that's potentially where we have uh, somewhat of a disagreement uh, and everything else about your... I think sounds wonderful. Um, the thought is really that, you know, the way we see it, credit is different than payments. I mean, payments, I think, uh, can and must be ubiquitous, uh, can be self-initiated by the customer. Uh, whereas credit is, you know, fundamentally about the customer. It's about underwriting. It's about understanding what is the right fit between what the customer wants and do you need a weekly payment, do you need a monthly payment. Uh, so our sense is that one way or the other, there is, you know, credit, does it have a cash and payments leg? Absolutely. So we have many clients of ours in the room uh, who work in very remote locations. Um, and while their core strength is a customer and underwriting, I think the fact is today many of us spend 60, 70% of our time counting cash. So I think it'd be fantastic if that goes away. But there is a residual piece around understanding what works well for the customer that it's hard to imagine that just the payments platform will enable. Yeah. Um, and uh, so it strikes us that credit probably evolves around a different path. Sure, sure. Uh, but let me explain. Yeah. No, there's no doubt that there's a huge need for first mile organizations that get into a deep understanding of customer needs and, and customize the product for them. So they, I'm, I'm not even this thing. But what's happening is that two things are happening. One is you're going to suddenly have enormous amounts of data, right. which digitally available as an exhaust, which you never had before. So your mobile phone has a hell of a lot of information about what you do. Your payments data will tell you how, how your payments are, what you buy, how many, your contact list tells you how many friends you have. Your social media tells you, you know, what you're doing out there. Uh, and uh, then a as, you know, if you're a, a you know, if you're an income tax payer, today I can, today, I can, I can if I give uh, consent to my provider, he can go and check my TDS returns on the Traces website. So suddenly, all these different data streams are all coming on, on onboarding at the same time. So there's going to be massive amounts of data, and it's also massive amounts of transaction data and, and so on, number one. Number two, the algorithms are emerging which will then figure out from this data whether the person is a good credit risk or not, which kind of loan is best for him. And you're going to ha these systems are going to be across uh, millions of people. Think of something like Google Now. You know, Google Now, for those who have Google, is very disturbing because if I'm sitting here, I'll say, you know, you better leave for the airport right now because your flight is at 8.30 and there's a traffic jam, you know, just around that junction. So you say, how the hell does Google know this? Right? How the hell does Google know that I'm even going? So Google knows, uh, seen my project, read my email, and figured out that I'm catching this flight to Bangalore. It has, it, it, it's looking at the traffic conditions in, uh, it has a map of Bombay. It's looking at the traffic conditions of vehicles on the highway, and, and you know, all that stuff. So, now they, in other words, when I get that message, it's personalized to me. But they're doing this personalization to 500 million people. So, suddenly, because of the combination of data, analytics, and scale, for the first time in history, you can deliver a customized experience to 500 million people using technology. 
So in your example, I agree, payments is straightforward. There's money flow in and out. Every credit situation is different. But ultimately, the software will figure out that there are many more that this person X falls into this group of people with this behavior. Right. So it's a different world. Yeah. But it sounds like part of leveraging all of this to make a big dent on credit, a, a, a big piece of that is how do we organize this data architecture and yeah. the customer data sure, architecture. Sure. Uh, and it sounds like this data is getting, uh, if you will, manufactured at different places, like you said, some on social media, some at my local uh, microfinance institution office. Um, how does one think about uh, the data architecture sure, yeah. in a way that we yeah. can you know, use sure. the five years to simultaneously... We can do, yeah. I think that's where I think uh, RBI and other organizations have to think this through. Because they have to build a publish and subscribe model with consent built in, which means that you can't predict which are the new data sources tomorrow, right? Tomorrow, Facebook get, may get replaced by Snapchat or something. So you have to assume that there'll be constantly new data sources. But there should be a common way for these data sources to publish the data to, you know, in a, with APIs and so on. There has to be a common way for a lender or a credit organization to subscribe to the data. And there has to be a common way for a customer to give consent that his data can be subscribed to. That's, these, these, these architectures are a public good. They, they can't be done by companies or, this is where RBI regulators are coming. So they have to design this architecture of multiple data sources to which you can subscribe, uh, which publish multiple uh, you know, uh, institutions that subscribe to the data and customer consent to share that data. So once you design that, then you can architect this to do that. And it sounds like ultimately the customer should own her data. Oh, absolutely. And no, you know, no, even we are not saying that the, the data is shared with customer consent to that lender to give you a loan. So it's, not, it's not that it's being given without your consent. Uh, so, so I think uh, if you have rules for publishing data. What, I mean, you said it's kind of RBI, but well, what I about mean, the RBI is nobody in India who does this stuff. So we have to figure out where to park this. But Isn't there yeah. also sort of a fundamental legal framework issue around customer data, ownership, Yeah, so we'll have consent. to look at what the Credit Information Act says. We have to look at what the Telecom Act says. We have to look at an overarching privacy framework for this. We have to look at how customer consent is given in a non-repudiatable manner. There are issues like that. Right. Yeah, you have to think through the, the privacy architecture, the legal architecture, the consent architecture, but have a common way of publishing and subscribing so that anybody can avail of that data. Right. No, absolutely. And I think... Uh, a lot of this comes together and, you know, particularly in the case of credit, part of our thinking at IFMR has been that unlike payments, uh, what we should produce is not a standardized set of instruments. What you describe as the role of the first mile institutions, that's been very much a pursuit with the KGFS model to say, how do you actually create customized sure. loan So it bundles. may be that in the final analysis, you will have a platform that does this data stuff and, uh, and the whole, uh, you know, uh, the machine learning. But the final thing combined with the high touch becomes the basis for deciding the loan, uh, loan thing. So it's like combination of that.